like to introduce Sid. We read his book, but it's pretty amazing. You can clap. cities across the world where you know creativity is really kind of part of their DNA you think of New York you think of Paris you think of anywhere in Italy you know and, um, in Atlanta you don't really think of that but I, I think maybe it's, it's something that's going to continue to flower and get better over time because I, I was real jazz when I came here to look at Atlanta as an opportunity for us to bring our business here because I left uh, Wisconsin in 2007 and um, we had moved it down to two cities to go to and Atlanta was not either of those two cities and my wife who's from the north said um, hey how about Atlanta and I was like praise the Lord uh, I'm from Mississippi so any any excuse to even, you know, fly down here was great for me. So I came down, and I was immediately struck by the hopefulness and the helpfulness of the people that are here. There's an ease to the city, uh, and a can-do and will-do by everybody, from my contractor to the guy making signs for us to people that we were buying or making furniture with, and it just was—it felt like this real frothy mix of, of things going on that was just wasn't obvious from, from the outside, but once you dug in, you went, man, this is a cool place. This is a really, really cool place. So anyway, I'm excited to be speaking to you all. Um, the, the, the big thing is, is, is I, I have now, at this stage of my life, I'm much older than most of you here, um, and I have the experience of, of really now being really a businessman as opposed to being just a creative person because all my previous jobs it was purely a cre or intended to be purely a creative role um, and what what I'm going to try to share with you today is is a little bit of my experience and and more importantly I, I think well not more importantly but it's up to y'all I would love to hear what's on y'all's minds if you have some questions or thoughts so I'm going to leave a pretty pregnant time for Q&A, um, but anyway, I'm going to briefly tell you what my experience is and really in design. I, I left Mississippi, I went to Old Mr. School, midway through college, I told my dad I wanted to go to design school in New York, and he's from Mississippi, and he, <laughs> <laughs> he was like, oh really, he, he was a, a chemist, and he said, you know what, why don't you finish regular school, and <laughs> then you can do whatever you want, so I did, and I didn't want to, but you know it turned out to be great advice. So I sold the Monte Carlo, <coughs> fled to New York, and um, you know just sort of jumped in. And I didn't, you know, I said, I don't know what the heck I'm doing, but I'm going to be a designer. I'm going to New York to become a designer. And I uh, went there, got a job working retail, and I said, shoot, Ralph Lauren didn't go to design school. Perry Ellis didn't go to design school. They somehow figured this out. But I said, you know what, I may better go to design school. So I went to Parsons and to FIT to get an interview. And they both kind of stiff-armed me and said, you know what, you basically have to start over. I was bummed. And, you know, funny enough, things kind of worked out. I was working in a store, and a guy that had a great clothing company that I loved called British Khaki was one of my customers. And he's like, what, what are your plans for life? I was like, well, I want to become a designer. He's like, well, I have a, you know, I need, I need a salesman. Um, to cover West Virginia to New Mexico, which for those of you in South Carolina, <laughs> is a pretty big swap. Uh, but anyway, he was uh, real cool, and he said, I'll show you how to design. And sure enough, 
the guy pulled the curtain back and showed me how to analyze fabrics, how to do specs, how to pitch colors, and I was getting paid for it. Not a lot, but I was getting paid for it. And it was cool also because I was still in sales, but I also was seeing the design side, which, you know, if, if anybody knows anything about our, our business, we, we're trying to keep as flat of an organization as possible. Um, you know, I don't, I don't mind washing windows, I don't mind vacuuming, because that means I get to be in a lot of different decision-making roles. It's maddening sometimes, because sometimes you've got too many plates in the air. And I say that really from the vantage point of the people that work with us. Because we got a lot to do. Like, for instance, when I worked at Polo, if, if there were 100 jobs at Polo, there were 150 people to do those jobs. And, and that's maddening because you can't really get as intimate and, and really into the product as you'd like to sometimes. Um, so anyway, I uh, worked for him and then found my way to work. I met my, my wife, my soon-to-be wife, and she was a fashion editor at Vogue. And so I, we kind of found ourselves in these groups of people. Our, 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 our family became the fashion world. You know, you know, you kind of hook up with different groups of people. And that was our, you know, set of friends. And so this guy was really brilliant. His name was David Cameron. And David, uh, if anybody remembers Stephen Sprouse, uh, the guy that did the graffiti, uh, he had a, a moment at Target with this, this graffiti, uh, uh, graffiti inspired clothes and a lot of day glow clothes. The guy was incredible. Real gentle, soft, very understated guy. Um, and then if you also remember and I guess he's still in front of our, our minds, is Isaac Mizrahi. Um, David Cameron was the guy in between those. You know, darlings of the, of the fashion critics, but guys who really couldn't make their businesses work. Um, it was too small and too special. But I learned so much from David, really about taking care of the brand and, and how it's super important. If you don't give it every bit of love and attention that it requires, then your brand won't be special. And I mean, when we sent out like if, you know, New York Magazine, which at the time was a good magazine, but not like Vogue or Elle or um, anything like that. But we, we would spend an hour preparing the garment bag that the clothes went out to go for a photo shoot. And when it got to the photo shoot, it was going to be ripped open and thrown out. But that was, that was my first sort of insight to how much care you need to take with everything you do. So anyway, I'm sorry to kind of get bogged down in this, but... We, uh, I left David and went to this company uh, that was still a fledgling company, and they couldn't find designers to come work for them because A, they were a catalog, and no self-respecting clothes designer wanted to work for a uh, catalog back then. And number two, they were in New Jersey. So you had to reverse commute, you know, from Manhattan to New Jersey. And this, this company was J. Crew. And so I got there in 85, which I think it started in early 84, late 83. And um, what was great is, is I was there in sort of the DNA formation of the brand. And kind of what we walked away from the brand as it being was, was a little preppy and a little hippie. It wasn't as, as you know, grungy as a, a Grateful Dead concert, but also wasn't too uptight or too preppy. And it was, you know, no logo. It was, it was Kind of faceless, but good colors, good fabrics, and quality was very important to us. So I would go to Port Authority, which I don't know if you've been to Port Authority, but it's not a great place. That's the bus station in Manhattan. I'd get there at like you know, 6 45 in the morning and take a bus to New Jersey and get there. That's when I first started drinking coffee. Um, I think I was 25 years old. But anyway, um, J. Crew was great because it was everything was happening. I mean, people were liking it, and the parts that I didn't realize at the time was the teamwork piece. You know, I, I, one of the first things I designed there was this thing called the barn jacket. I well, know some of you that are older may remember the barn jacket, but it was a water repellent, corduroy collar, hunting jacket inspired by, you know, 35 hunting jackets that we pulled from thrift shops or, you know, uh, flea markets. But anyway, the price of this thing was $88. And it was shot on, does everybody know Matthew Barney, the artist? He was the model for the barn jacket. And nobody knew who Matthew Barney was then. He was a former football player at Yale or Princeton somewhere. Anyway, I thought I was responsible for the success of the barn jacket. And it was 
recorded me was also the person who sourced the fabric for me, the person who made the connection with the factory, the person who picked the model, the person who shot the, the campaign, people who fulfilled it. And it really opened my eyes later on, not then, because I again thought I was responsible for this success. It, creativity is a team sport, and that's really kind of my first point this morning. Is, is, is creativity is better for me when I can collaborate and get feedback. It really, I, I thrive on that. And, and interestingly, growing up, I was not so great at individual sports, but I loved, you know, playing football, or basketball, or baseball. I loved being in the band too. It's nothing like kind of walking on the field at halftime with all these people that you work so hard with to come up with something that you're presenting. It's the same thing, I think, with our clothes or any creative campaign that you're working on. Um, but I'm, I'm also much better when I can ask people, hey, what do you think? You know, and and we, we kind of liken it to volleyball, you know, when you can keep the ball in the air. It's super important, even if your first idea out there is completely stupid or so far out there that nobody gets it, just hit the ball back in the air. You know, that's, that's what's important. Because somebody else may be able to grab and go, oh yeah, I can, uh, 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 orange is the whole thing for next season? Yeah, okay, so we'll, we're working around fall colors or whatever it is, something that's germane back to clothes. But in a sense, it's really important though for you to be able to interact and, and, and with each other as a creative group, but then interact with other teams in your organization. Uh, or at least that's my experience, because as designers, I, you know, I think y'all are similar to me. We're a little bit like the story of Joshua and Caleb, who were, you know, two of the twelve spies that were sent over into the Promised Land. You know, they come back. Joshua and Caleb were like, "Yeah, let's take it." The other ten were like, "No, they're too strong. They're too powerful. We can't do it." And um, so they had to wander around, you know, for forty more years before they could go into the Promised Land. The, the point is, is you're going to need some people that can go out there. We're the scouts, and I don't, I don't mean to say we like we own the process, but in a sense, design's kind of first in the pool, first out of the water, first out of the gate, first over the hill to be able to tell people over the hill, hey, come on over, I got something over here. And so we're the catalyst to kind of get things going. But when those people get to the top of the hill and look down, they don't see anything, we've got to explain what's here. And I, I went to this uh, leadership conference a few years ago. It's was, it was basically a reform school for, for people uh, because I was a bad guy at work. But they sent me to this thing, and it was, it was pretty good. It was, uh, they, uh, anyway, we had to do this, this, um, this thing where you had four teams, and they gave you this uh, problem to solve. And during the problem that you were solving, they would come in and say, oh, your, your planes, for instance, they said, you've got to deliver uh, this vase to Egypt and be back to New York by such and such a time. And when you deliver it, you've got to interact with this, this, and this group. You've got to interact with the government group, and the creative group, and the museum group. Something similar to that. Meanwhile, they would change it and say, oh, your flight's been canceled, um, and also this team member is not part of your team anymore. But, I, I, I was not a huge analytical thinker. These were mostly, mostly business people in the room. And I'm more of a creative thinker, but I also have an analytical side. But these people that I was interacting with needed someone to put a white paper on the wall and kind of lay out what the steps should be in a kind of in, in a way that they could understand. That's kind of, that's us. Is how do we explain to people? the mystery of creativity and make it clear what we're, we want to help them accomplish. So anyway, at that point, creativity is a team sport. The flip side of that, being a team sport, that also doesn't dismiss the responsibility of us to have a clarity of vision. And I know all of you, you know, I'm saying this like this is all new news to you, and I, I don't mean it that way. I, I'm just trying to open it up so that, that we're on the same page. but. Clarity of vision is super important. You've got to be pretty sure in what your point of view is and have confidence in what your point of view is. And if the, the people you're working with don't accept that, you've got to be nimble and thick-skinned enough to be able to bust a move and say, okay, 
I got another idea. I got another idea. You know, and, and that's really the, the one of the best people I've ever worked with is a girl named Laura O'Brien at Land's End. And she was so brilliant because she would come to any big creative meeting and say, here's my idea. And she would present it in always this really sweet, gentle way. And Lee Eisenberg, who used to, uh, was the creative director, would say, I don't like that. And she'd say, oh, I got another great idea. <laughs> and she would, I mean, literally would have 10 ideas. Boom, boom, boom. And never got hung up on her idea. And oftentimes, the whole thing would come back to her original idea. But she showed a willingness and flexibility there to kind of share in what people were hearing and saying to go, hey, let's talk it out. You know, what, what's everybody thinking? So uh, the, the, the confidence and clarity of your vision has to show when you come into a situation with the other disciplines in the organization. Um, so anyway, the last thing is, 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 is I, I feel like I get to do what I do. I, I really love what I do is because I get to interact with people, all sorts of people. I mean, we get to interact with creative people, business people, medical people, food people. It, it really is a, a, a great mix of people. And our job at, at Sid Management, we, we don't do a great job, but despite what people say that we do a great job, I feel like so many times we don't do as good a job as, as I would like for us to do. Our biggest goal is how do we serve people? Because you can get clothes anywhere. Yeah, you can you can buy a shirt or pants or shoes all over the town, all over the country, all over the internet. So how do we really set ourselves apart is is, is really by taking care of people. It's a little bit like that silly you know song of cheers, you know. You, you want to go to a place where everybody knows your name. It's nice when you walk in, somebody goes, hey Andy. What's going on? Or, uh, you know, hey Stefan, hey, it, it's, it's a good feeling. I mean, I feel good. So we really try to work hard on talking about when people come into the store, how do you kind of hug people with your eyes? And then when they leave, hug them goodbye, at least with your eyes. And I know I'm getting off the creative side, but it, it, it kind of leans into attitude. Your attitude. I mean, your attitude should be infectious because everybody's in this room uh, not just to make money. Because this is not the, the you know the uh, best place to make money is in the creative business. But it's something we all love, and it's an expression of our heart and our head. It's where it comes together. And I I feel fortunate that my my avocation, which was clothes, you know, it was, was you would look at me as a kid and go, this kid is this is not going to work. Uh, I would wear things that were, whatever GQ put out there, I'd wear in Brandon, Mississippi. And it was, it was like a freak show. <laughs> I can't even imagine the things I, I put on my back and, and thinking they were cool. Um, but anyway, um, I lost my mind. Uh, the, the, the point is, is, is that I, we get to do what we get to do. So I, I loved clothes. I love clothes, and I always liked working with people. So working in a business where I could work in clothes was so great. That became my vocation. So my avocation led to my vocation, and uh, now that's my vacation because I've spent all my time there at work too. But I, it's it's because I love it, and I don't feel like it's work. It really is an expression of my heart and my head. And just touching people, it's it's pretty great to, to walk in there every day. So my big point in that is is work hard. You know, don't don't really not give it your all always. Um, because people are looking to you for a little bit of hope and something new that they hadn't seen, some little flower or a way to look at things. That's that's the one thing I think we all share, is that we're able to see things that other people don't see. And it's a gift. It's nothing but a gift. And what's really great is when you can see that and communicate it to people who can't see that. They love it. They love that. And then it's the same thing for them. I mean, a guy talks to me about, you know, real estate. I'm like, Phew. it completely goes over my head. But when he can communicate it clearly, I'm like, it's fascinating. People look at us like we're fascinating. You know, because they don't really, it's not, you know, the creative piece is a, a hard one to get your, get your hands on. So anyway, I'm prattling on a little bit. I, I, I hope this is somewhat helpful. But really, 
I'd love to hear if there's anybody that can sort of riff on this or have questions or thoughts. Um, and not, not just to me, but to the whole room. Yes, wait. Hey, Sid. Thanks. Uh, hold on. Now I know that the ticket pocket is for extra ideas for meetings. Um, but uh, I think you feel something probably more acutely than we do because you're right at the intersection of the market and creativity. And I can come up with a sketch and I can wave my arms around the boardroom and pitch something. And I can pitch a pink elephant. But you've got a kind of capital intensive business where you have to buy 10,000 yards of pink cashmere in order to present a pink elephant to the market. So how do you negotiate that creativity and market demand? Uh, and you know, there's that, that pull of, I want to push the Atlanta market to yeah. some extent, right? Yeah. But you're a fairly conservative market. Yeah. So how do you refresh that balance so it's not just the market demanding what you want to do, but you're able to kind of push us folks a little bit further? It, it's a, that's a great question, Blake, because um, I have to say that the, the, the reason I even have a store is really a selfish pursuit. I went to New York to become a designer. I worked in a retail environment and was, had access to everything in New York and then went to work for David Cameron, which, you know, Anna Wintour, Polly, Polly Mellon, you know, Jay Hobson, um, all these people were coming to our showroom all the time. It's like, no big deal. And, then after that, I went to work for J. Crew, and J. Crew has a quasi-vertical approach to selling. So they go straight from home, straight from manufacturing to the retail market. The benefit of that is, is they're able to keep their prices lower, still have their margins optimized, but most importantly to me is you have, still have an intimacy with the customer. I have a direct conversation. So in a funny sense, I'm, I'm inside on a conversation with customers to know what they're looking for. The other thing that helps is, wait, I've been doing this for, you know, I've been in the clothes for over 35 years now. So I'm pretty comfortable. I can I can turn the double play by myself, pretty much, okay? I don't want to, because I like doing it with other people and I get better results that way. But I, I know what America wants to wear, pretty much. Not, not always. And, the other thing we tried, and I think that uh, Matt can vouch for this, that in our store, we I, I like the idea of appealing to a 15-year-old and an 85-year-old. A guy from Little Five Points and a guy in Montana. A guy that travels the world and a guy that's barely been out of Douglasville. I mean, I, I really like a big hug when it comes to people. Um, it's, more, it's more fun. Um, because I, I'm not really, it, it's funny, when I wrote the business plan, it was not about a demographic, it was about a psychographic. You like clothes? This is your store. If you're a guy, this is your store. After that, I don't need a, I don't need an age range, I don't need a color, I don't need a race, a sex, a creed, I don't need any of that. I just want someone that's interested. And, and funny enough, the, the people that, that are, um, that come to our, that frequent our store more than anything, I think, you, you can clarify this or not, People who know nothing about clothes and people that know a lot about clothes. The guys in the middle, they're not as interested in, in, a, in a strange way. So we, we find people that, that uh, on, on kind of the, the, the fringe a little bit, but the other thing I learned working in, at J. Crew and versus working in Polo, because Polo's basically their story is to the, to the manner born. You know, we're, we deserve this, this is where we are, this is our rightful place. I like a much more egalitarian or populistic or democratic approach to, to dressing people. You know, we have jeans in the store for 55 bucks. If you want them tapered or customized for you, we'll do that for $20. We have six for $8,000. You know, and I don't do that. It's not a trick thing. It's like, it's, I love that stuff up there. I only sell a little bit of it, but I want to have it because I want to say we know what the best is. But also, there's nothing like a pair of good Levi's jeans also. You know, at that price point, it, it keeps, you know, giving you returns. So anyway, the, the long of this is, is I, I have a better relationship with the customer. I've got a lot of experience in doing it, and I learn a lot from the customer. Because we tweaked our, tweaked our um, assortment a little bit, not a lot, because we, the, the other thing is, is, is that clarity of vision that I spoke to a second ago. you got to go back to that. 
And we don't, we haven't changed a lot of what we do. As a matter of fact, in three or four years, you'll probably go, man, he's got the same pins in here. He's got the same shirts in here. You know why? Because they work. They, they're, we, they're, a friend of mine, a Tang guy, used to use the word uh, evergreen. Oh, it's evergreen. And, you know, it's like, yeah, that's a great way of putting it. That's what we want to do is have something that worked 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. And so then I can also, if I'm wearing some clothes, if I'm in Mississippi, I don't want to look like a, a fashion, you know, victim, but I want to be in an outfit that I can fly to New York and go, oh, you really look smart. I don't want to have to have a wardrobe change when I change locales and then go to Italy. I don't want to have to put on a new seal to go there. So the other thing is, is, is trying to make sure that the customers kind of understand where we're coming from. Because for us, the ingredients and the quality piece is super, super, super cool. It's a little bit like Alice Waters did with her food years ago, where the ingredients almost became the star. If you've got great ingredients, you can mess up some things along the way. So for our fabrics, we primarily buy two-ply, two-ply fabrics from England and Italy, period. Okay? We only use a certain type of cashmere yarn with a certain micron link and a, um, or excuse me, a certain yarn length and a certain micron size for our shoes, Goodyear welted. So we, there's some things that we put in there from a quality perspective. It's the quality piece is huge and I think undervalued. And if you can mix that with some good price points, that's where the commerce uh, and art really start to sing. And that's actually another good phrase that I learned that lands in the woman who hired me there who's head of merchandising. She's really a businesswoman. But she really believed in the creative team being a very important part of, of what we did as a company. So she would you know, talk about art and science, the art and science, the art and science. If those can converge at a very high level, that's when you get the music. And another, another person that was a huge proponent of that was, uh, was it Thomas Hoving or Walter Hoving that uh, ran Tiffany's forever. Uh, anyway, he put design, design was, uh, was really a little bit on a pedestal, but Tiffany's was about making money. So, uh, good design, we all know in here, good design sales. When you look at Apple, a lot of that's because of the design. And interestingly about Apple though is, is he wasn't first to the party on hardly any of those uh, products. You know, the iPod, you know, he was not late to the party, but he wasn't the first. So he took something and just kind of made it his own and tweaked it. And I say him, I don't mean to characterize the whole company as Steve Jobs, but the Apple team, the guy, I don't know who the guy is, runs design, they great. But they took it and appleized it and made it so that we all wanted to touch it and feel that we use it. But again, it's, it's like riffing on an idea. And if you'll notice in our stores, there's not a lot of whole, not a lot of super original ideas. It's really just our sort of spin or twist on it. Yes? Uh, you talked earlier about creativity being a team sport. Uh, can you talk about the, uh, your processes where you're thinking about attracting the creative team and keeping the creative team? Um, you know, particularly, I know this is something that I've had to deal with in my business. You know, you have someone who's really great at what they do, and then two years they go off and they don't get in. And so how do you find a good team and how do you keep them? I see if I have an answer for that. <laughs> That's a hard one. It yeah. really is. I mean, we've, we're literally, right now, we're putting one leg in front of the other and trying to push forward. Um, you, you know, you, the, the most important part of my business is the people piece. And I'm not suggesting I do it well because I know I don't. Because I you know, expect a certain level of uh, work. and. You know, I'm a little hard to work with sometimes, but it's because I, I I want to get the best out of people, and I want to I want to share the best with other people. So you want to find people that say, okay, I'm ready to work, and I'm ready to work hard, and I want to be great. I, I I've never really kind of jumped into anything to be second place. You know, I don't I don't mind getting second place sometimes, but I want to win. And I, I want other people around me that are that way. So we try to foster an environment of uh, 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 recognition and acknowledgement. It's a, it's, sh it's a shared, you know, a shared experience. It's it's not. Sid, the only reason Sid Mashman's 
name is on the doors because in the end, my friend, the name, the working name of the company is going to be called Dubuque because that's where my wife was born. Oh, that's a cool name. It's on the Mississippi River. It's kind of French, kind of this. And my friend said, yeah, it's, it reminds me of Riverboat Gambling. I was like, not, not what I want to get across. And so I kind of found myself, well, what's the name of the, of the company going to be? And it became Sid Meshman because, you know what? People will know that the button kind of stops here. Um, but it's not really just about me. It's about all the people that kind of come into our world. And I get inspiration from kids that come in, the old people that come in, um, you know, the first guy that worked, there's just two guys that worked with me in the beginning, was Dow, who's still there, the tailor, and another guy named Randy Piles, and we all kind of smoked the same stuff, you know, and, and it was like, we, we wanted good, uh, kind of cool clothes, a little colorful, but not too prepped out, and, um, but something that has cheer and some energy and excitement. That's the kind of people we try to look for when we hire, is people that have some light behind their eyes, you know, they're engaged and want to do some things that are really kind of fun and exciting. Keeping them, um, not okay. <laughs> We've lost a few people, but you know what? When someone wants to go, we say, let us help you build your plane. Or let us help you put the gas in your engine to go somewhere. We've had two of our guys now work at GQ, uh, and we uh, definitely made phone calls. It was on the phone with them to say, let's let's help them here. Um, and one of the guys we went to Barney's, we, you know, it's like, how do I help people get to the next step? I don't want to hold anybody down. It's the other thing about hiring, some of you, see, this this is an arguable point. Rick, I think you may have a point of view on this, but if someone says they want to go, I'm to the point where don't count them. You know, how do I help you go? Because they're gone anyway. Mentally, there's a checkout that's occurred that I'm gone. I may come back, but I'm leaving. And so um, we try to, when that occurs, I'm like, man, how can I help you find what's best for you? Because in the end, selfishly, it helps me. You know, it's like, if I help them, it's, it's a good thing for me because I feel better. And also, they're getting to a better place. They're going to feel better about themselves. And they've got other fish to fry. You know, and um, I'm not sure I really am answering your question. No, but I, I think your follow-up about the, how you deal with the is just a good insight. Because that's exactly, I think, one of the issues I dealt with was a guy who had an intimated over a period of year that he wanted to do more. And so I tried to give him more internally without maybe being in denial that it was an entrepreneurial grind. And I think the way you left, I think, was probably one way in ethical, but in ethical, but just and you can't help that either, right? You can't help and that. really, you have to kind of avert your gaze and, yeah. and not even judge that person on that, because right. it's a moment in time, and we all make poor decisions, and we all act the wrong way at some point. And if someone had, had my rap sheet, yeah, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> The written, go ahead. Yeah, what? What's the worst thing that's ever happened to you as a designer? <laughs> <laughs> the worst story of all the worst stories. Besides getting fired? Yeah, I mean, the, the thing that, you know, where you're just like, oh my God. Um, that's that. Nobody's asked me that before. Um, <laughs> um, uh, I, I would probably have to say it's with probably with Ralph Law. You know, I was in J. Crew and I was kind of king of the hill. And I could do anything and make any call. Not really, but pretty much. Um, and so I, it's kind of like getting called up to the Yankees. I get to call up my farm to go there. And I went, they asked me to come there to start this label. And they didn't realize what they brought me that it was um, how important the price scheme. And the value proposition of J. Crew is. J. Crew looks cool and has, has a cool vibe, but it's still about the price. And they didn't realize that at Polo. They thought that I could just kind of come in and do this thing and we'll go to, go to market. And I had to sit in on this massive presentation where, you know, it was kind of where everything was coming to a head. Sid was supposed to start this design um, brand for Polo. And um, we had products at the time, it was Gap, Banana. 
uh, Abercrombie, J. Crew, and you know, and Ralph is a pretty intense guy in the East. <laughs> and, uh, she had to be very close to him because he didn't speak out. And it was very intimidating because you were like, you know, by the end you were like up in his face, but what are you saying? Um, and you know what, most everything he said was pretty great, but he's like, yeah, this J. Crew stuff is a piece of crap. And I was like, no offense, but that fabric's actually from the same mill that your fabric's from. Those are mother of pearl buttons. The only difference between these two shirts is, is that yours has a split back yoke and the J. Crew one's slightly larger than yours. And you can see he had kind of been hit by a car going, what, why is it $38? I said, because it's vertical. They don't have to wholesale it. And then he really was hit by a car. It's like, I mean, you could just hear the brakes sort of scratching on the whole thing. And the guys, his lieutenants there, um, his financial guys, said, um, we can't do a vertical thing because Macy's and really, all of our current accounts will boot us out. And um, so that was a little bit of, I, I went home that night feeling a, a little upset. You know, and I, I, I knew, I, I had the clarity of vision, but I was not on the same page anymore. And I could feel that I'd been cast out a little bit. Um, it wasn't that bad, though. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm the kind of person, if things like that happen, you know, it was a good reason. And I learned from it. And I, my skin got a little bit tougher through that. And, and I left Polo the, the same way. Not unethically, but a little bit on bad terms. You know what? I didn't commit. I didn't give them everything. J. Crew, I gave them everything. Lands in, I gave them everything. Polo, I didn't give it up. I was not mature enough, nor was I committed to that vision enough to really give them all. I, I regret that. But that was a learning piece, too. So, um, as a matter of fact, I'd say uh, from a success place on paper, Polo's at the bottom. But from a growth perspective, absolutely at the top. Yes. Yeah, uh, you said earlier that we're all kind of salesmen and creative at the same time. Yes. Uh, we all kind of sell subjective things. Some things are functional, some things are just, you know, a, a logo or a web page, brochure, an ad, whatever. When you're selling or pitching a fabric or a pattern or a color, how do you, how do you back that up? How do you sell that? How do you, because someone could say, oh, I don't like that pattern, I like this pattern. But you obviously have a recommendation. How do you how do you do that? How do you back up certain choices? We're selling it before you walk in the door. We're selling the opportunity for you to come visit us because you're the whole reason we even exist. The customer is the whole reason that I can put bread on my table. And so when you pull up in the parking lot, we put this sort of fit in its fake. It's kind of cool. Hey, foliage around the uh, place. And um, oh, what's this? I hadn't seen this. And oh, this is kind of cool. You want to touch it and you kind of draw. It's like we're kind of pulling you in a little bit. When you walk in, someone should greet you and say hello. There should be a hospitality interaction. The music's playing. It's on vinyl. Sometimes we play the iPod, mostly vinyl. Um, it's just, it sort of suggests a warmth. Uh, the displays, everything's very touchable. Uh, price tags are hard to find, which is a bummer. We're still trying to sort that out because I don't, I don't like it when anybody has to kind of try to figure things out. Uh, we're, we offer you a drink, you want a Coke, you want water, you want beer. What can we get you? Make yourself at home. And we, we really try to condition ourselves to, when you walk in the door, not to go, hey, what can I find for you today? It's, it's more like, hey, how are you? And we literally try to walk away. I think sometimes it's misjudged as our indifference towards you when really it's we're trying to give you space to interact with the store. And then if you counter around for three or four minutes, then we, we, and we also offer you a drink at the very beginning. Then after you're hanging around for three or four minutes, then we'll say, can we help you? Are you finding everything okay? We don't even get to the can we help you yet. Are you finding everything okay? And then the third time we say, can we help you find something today? So the selling is a very subtle piece music, the offering of a drink, the uh, environment, the floor, everything is, is selling in a sense. And as a, uh, does anybody in here know Richard Altuna, uh, the store designer? 
He's, he's very good. Um, he, he made a statement to me one time. He said, when the people walk in the door, you want them to smell the cookies baking. So it's really like they're coming in the front door of your house. And if we can get that, and I'm not suggesting we do that, but if we can do that, it is great. Um, so does that, does that answer a little bit? A little bit, yeah. Like I can, I'll catch up with you later. I know Blake wants to.